Let me pray. Almighty God, we ask that you send your spirit to walk with us and among us as we begin our Lenten journey. We thank you that there is nowhere you will not go to be with us. We ask you to stir our hearts, our minds, and spirits as we worship you this day. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our hymn of praise, number 426, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Hymn number 426. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good. Have you had a good week? Did you do anything nice for anybody this week? Did you help anybody? What did you do to help somebody, Landon? Well, that was very good of you. Somebody said a bad thing about someone and Landon told them not to say that again. Rustin, Nadia, have y'all had any good experiences this week? I bet you have. It's, it's kind of hard to think of when somebody puts you on the spot in front of church. But um, you open the door for somebody? That is wonderful. And all of us do things to help other people. Well, I hope we all do. Um, it's just common courtesy. It's nice. It helps us to helps other people to get to know us better, and it helps us to feel better about ourselves, too. This morning, we're thinking about all the wonderful things that Jesus does for us, and it's hard to comprehend just how far Jesus would go to help us. Jesus would do anything, anything to help us to be his children and to do better. But it's kind of as Jesus helps us and does things for us, what does Jesus expect us to do? Help other people, just like Jesus has helped us. So we all need to trust in Jesus 
in the hard times, but also Jesus wants us to follow his example and help other people just like Jesus has helped us. Now, I have a friend that gave me a present just this morning, and it was perfect to talk about this um, point that we're trying to make. Um, Rustin, can, you can hold that. Can you tell me what that is, and Landon, and uh, Nadia? It's a cross, but what, what a... Lots of people around it, what are they doing? They're all carrying it together. You can hold it, Nadia. And um, he brought me that back to me to remind us of how we all worked together a couple years ago when he was having a rough time during the hurricane. And um, that reminded me, as, as I was thinking about this passage of Scripture, when Jesus went to the farthest extreme to try and help people. And Jesus wants us to help others just like he's helped us. Let's have prayer together. Loving God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have done so much for us, that your grace covers everything that we do. We pray that we would remember that we need to offer your grace to people just as you've offered it to us. Be with us this day and this week and help us to do that. These things we pray in Christ. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. My God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for your faithfulness and your steadfast love, your goodness and your salvation that sustain us. We confess that our faithfulness to you has not been as constant, that we have fallen short in the ways we follow you and your commands. We confess that we have failed to listen to your words, that we have ignored your invitation to follow, that we have shut our eyes and ears and hearts to the cries of others, that we have put our own desires above the needs of many, that we have indulged ourselves to our own detriment. We confess that we are sinners in need of your grace. We ask that you do not give up on us, that you take us by the hand, put us back on course, teaching us your way once again, underpinned by your strength and love. Restore us to you, that we might lift up our hearts and minds and voices to focus on Christ calling us to follow him wherever and however that may be. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Let us join together now as we sing our offertory hymn number 256. There is a fountain filled with blood. Hymn number 256. Let's stand as we sing.
Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this place that we worship and these people who come to follow you and your words. May we give to you and your people out of the kindness of our heart and our thoughts of people. May we give our energy and give our time to pray for those that need it. May we worship in our minds and keep you in our heart. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our New Testament reading for this day is found in Paul Peter's first letter, the third chapter, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. These are the words of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are grateful for the gift of this day and these moments together as a family of faith. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit will work among us, filling us with your love, your truth, and your power. 
that we may be shaped in the image of Christ our Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. When our scripture on a given Sunday is a narrative text or that of telling a story from the Bible, on a historical account, I feel sometime during the course of the week a little nudge, a spirit nudge asking the question, David, what do you think it was really like to be there and to be with that person and to experience God in that way? What do you think it was really like. We, we can learn so much from the scripture, but put yourself in that place at that time, and, and what do you think you would have remembered or experienced and felt? What would it have been like to have built that huge boat and calling all the animals into the ark and seeing a porcupine and, or a couple of porcupines walk up that, that plank into the ark? I'd never seen a critter quite like that before. Or, or what would it have felt like Imagine standing there on that battlefield and seeing Goliath fall and you could just feel the, the thud when he hit. Could you feel that in your feet all the way up into your body when that, that giant fell and you knew that it was not just an act of David, it was an act of God? What did those hot coals that the seraphs touched Isaiah's lips with, what did they really feel like? Was there a holy burn there or was there a sweetness there that cleansed and purified Isaiah? And put yourself on that mount with all of those people there listening, hanging on every word that Jesus teaches. I, I know what he is saying. I have always believed it. I just didn't have a way of saying it the way he does. Some of them thought. What would it have been like to have heard the Sermon on the Mount or to hear the teachings of Jesus in person? What would Gethsemane be? To, to see Jesus pray himself into a, a holy sweat, to feel his anxiety of that moment. What would it be like to hear the sound of that hammer hitting those nails that were poured into Jesus' arms and feet. Could you hear that sound? And what does an, a, a partially used tomb smell like? There, there's a little bit of a holy nudge. Anytime I approach a narrative text, that prompts me to, to wonder, what would it be? You know, if time travel ever becomes a possibility in my lifetime... I'm first going to travel forward, and I'm going to get the lottery numbers, and then I'm going to come back, and, and then I'm going to take my winnings, and I'm going to tour all these different places and sights and sounds of, of what it was like to experience God in these stories. I don't think the story that Peter refers to in our text is going to be very high on my list, though. Our passage from 1 Peter is not a narrative per se. It is a teaching from 1 Peter, but he does make reference to a, a narrative account or an historical event when he said that there was a time when Jesus made proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey. Now, this is a challenging text and it's, it's great fun to look into this text and to see what it is that 1 Peter is referring to. And, and scholars have all kinds of ideas as to what he's mentioning here. But the, the most well-founded interpretation is one that prompts us to refer back to the sixth chapter of Genesis in verses 1 through 4 and read a, a very brief account of something that took place in the very ancient of days. In Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4, we hear of sons of God or of spirits or of angels, if you will, who, even though they are celestial beings, they fall in love with women, human women. And they are so in love with these human women that they take these women to be their wives and they have children with these women. 
And those children become great and powerful warrior giants. Now, this experience, it displeases God because that is not what God intended for these angels. They were to be celestial, heavenly beings and not falling in love with human women and having um, marriages and children with them. And God is so displeased with these spirits that he punishes them. First Enoch is not in your Bible. It is an extra-biblical source. Enoch is believed to have been the great-grandfather of Noah, but he wrote uh, an account of this experience, and in First Enoch he writes that God asking these spirits, why have you abandoned the, abandoned the high, holy, and eternal heaven and slept with women? You used to be holy, spiritual, You used to be the living ones possessing eternal life, but now you have defiled yourselves, God asks these angels. And then God, in such anger and in such wrath with these angels, that he sends them to a prison. A prison that is located inside of a mountain that is on the far edges of the earth. And at some point, Peter says, Jesus goes and preaches to the spirits. He makes proclamation to the spirits, we read. Now, as I said, I I don't know that I would want to get on my time machine and travel back and experience this. But I, I am curious, what did Jesus say to those spirits? What do you think the theme of his message was in that event. I I don't really care to go back, but I would love to know. And the word that Peter uses here, the word for proclamation or the word for preaching here, it is the Greek word kariso, which is intentionally vague. Kariso means to uh, announce or to proclaim without giving any specifics or details as to what it is that you have proclaimed. Peter is very intentional in using that word and keeping it something of a mystery as to what it was that Jesus said to these spirits. And Peter is simply trying to be a good pastor here. He is trying to assure the the people that Jesus has dealt with sin and death and evil and then therefore you need not worry about it at all. But still I wonder What is it that Jesus said to these spirits? Many of you have heard most of my sermons. And and you know, I I don't try to make you scared of hell a whole lot. But I know that there are preachers out there who, who speak of hell simply trying to get you to go to heaven by making you afraid of hell. I've heard sermons like that. But what do you say to a group of people who already have one foot in hell? What do you say to them? In his comment on this text, Richard Vinson, who is one of our better Baptist New Testament scholars these days, says that perhaps that Jesus went to this prison, not hell, but this this spiritual prison, if you will, to give the angels their final judgment. To assure them of God's displeasure with them. And that may be. But Vincent also goes on to say that Peter is simply trying to assure his people that sin and evil have been defeated. That God is in control. That Christ has defeated evil. That Christ has defeated these angels that have taken advantage of these human women. And and that God is in control. So therefore... Since God has defeated death and God has defeated sin and evil, you need not dabble with sin at all. Peter is simply being a good pastor in this entire passage here and saying, don't bother with sin. And I think Peter's pastoral nature is extending to us today. I I, I think he would stand here and say, don't worry about what Jesus told those angels. Just be focused on the fact that he has dealt with them but I can't get over it. 
Maybe it's the fact that I'm a student of preaching and so on, but more especially, I'm a disciple of Christ, and I want to know as much about this man as I can possibly learn, and so I want to know, what did Jesus say? Did he go to that spiritual present prison to, to give that final judgment? Did he go and say, you fellows are done for. You're out of here. You're banished to nothingness. You're banished to hell. Get out. That may very well be. But wouldn't it be somewhat out of character of the Jesus that we meet in the Gospels if that was so? The Jesus that I meet in the Gospels never shied away from calling a sin a sin. He, he never shied away from speaking true, judging words. But with every truth he spoke, with every judgment he made, he also opened the door for redemption, for mercy, encouraging people to live God-centered lives. You see, friends, it's just a little hard for me to balance these gods out that we read about here. It's hard for me to reconcile a God who would come into this world to save us from our sins with a God who would go out into the far reaches of creation to give a part of his creation the final push into torment. It's just hard to figure those two out or to put them together. For a God who would send his one and only son into the world to save us from our sin, a God who would let his son die on a cross is a God of relentless love. A God who never gives up on his creation, especially those who have at least just an ounce of remorse and will acknowledge their need for God. I, I think that that may very well be the most certain truth that we can take from this story. We don't know what Jesus said, and chances are we never will know what Jesus said to those spirits. But there's enough grace in just the mere fact that he went to help us know who he truly is. There's grace enough in the fact that there is nowhere too far for Jesus to go to embody and to proclaim the love of God. Jesus was willing to go to this outer spiritual prison to proclaim and to embody himself. And no matter where we are, no matter what we find ourselves, no matter what kind of hell we think we are in at this point in our lives, God is there with us. There is nowhere too far for God to go. Last week, as you know, we gathered right here in this room and we worshiped and our children stood here on this chancel and sang and they read the scripture and they prayed and they preached and did a fantastic job. I was so proud of our children and our parents and our children's ministry. And I was so impressed by the confidence that each one of those children had. They stood up here as ones who knew exactly what they were doing. They were confident of several things. Confident that God loves them. Confident that their families love them. Confident that their church loves them. And confident in their own God-given abilities. Each one of them did a phenomenal job. And I was especially thankful that one of our children stood right here. And reminded us of the words of Paul. Radical words. For I am convinced, Paul said, that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. 
She stood right here and she said that. She, she had the courage to proclaim those words to say that I know that no matter where I go and what I do, nothing is going to separate me from the love of God. And I stood right there and I said, oh, dear child, I pray that you believe that. And I pray that every one of us believes that. Not just knows it here, but that we believe it right here. Oh, I hope and pray that we as a family of faith believe that. I pray that we understand that nothing can get in the way of God's love. It doesn't matter what I have thought. It doesn't matter what I have felt. It doesn't matter what I have done. It doesn't matter what I have left undone. God loves me. God loves us. It doesn't matter who I love. It doesn't matter who I struggle to love. God loves me. Especially when we wonder if we are loved at all. And there are times in our lives when life gets so intense that we are tempted to wonder if God is there, and if God is there, then does God love us? Kate Bowler has reason to wonder that. Kate has written a profound little book entitled, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies That I Have Loved. Kate is an assistant professor at Duke Divinity School. She's also a mom. She and her husband, Tobin, have a beautiful little two-year-old or so little boy. And life has been good to Tobin and Kate and their little boy. But a, a couple of years ago, Kate got a phone call from her doctor. The news isn't good. You need to come in right away. It's cancer. A very, very serious cancer. So Kate put the phone down and she went right to the doctor and sure enough, the diagnosis was very grim. She'd been diagnosed with stage four liver cancer. And her book is a recounting of her walk with this cancer, but also her walk with God and how the people around her have helped her through each day. Fortunately for Kate, she qualified for a clinical study that was being held down at Emory in Atlanta, and she's been going back and forth to Atlanta for radical chemotherapy treatments, and, and, and things are okay right now. But there have been some really dark days when she's wondered, God, are you there? And if you are there, what happened? Do you not love me anymore? But she said in one of the darkest moments, or one of the moments where she was at a point of desperation, she was lying in the hospital bed, and, and, and she wrote this. At a time when I should have felt abandoned by God, I was not reduced to ashes. I felt like I was floating on the love and prayers of all those who hummed around me like worker bees, bringing notes and flowers and warm socks and quilts embroidered with words of encouragement. They came in like priests and mirrored back to me the face of Jesus. There's nowhere too far for Jesus to go to reach us. To assure us of his love. Nowhere too far. Not even our deaths. Or the deaths of our loved ones. Or the deaths of our dreams. Or our ways of living. And Kate's experience is true. Jesus comes to us. In the friends and in the family that we love and dear. And there are many acts of kindness. Just this morning in our Sunday school class, one of our members just spoke words of deep, deep, profound gratitude for how Jesus has ministered to her through our class. Jesus comes in those kind words of people that we know and have shared life with. But don't ever forget that 
Jesus can also appear in the most unlikely of places, in the faces of strangers. Over the past couple of months, I've asked you to pray for my friend Ed. Ed is a pastor in Bowie's Creek, and he's one that I look up to very much. Ed is the pastor who, on Christmas Eve, lost his wife and his home, his way of life, to a tragic house fire. His daughters, Shannon and Megan, survived, but his wife, Sarah, did not. And the past two months have been as close to hell for Ed as any of us can possibly imagine. But Ed has told the story of in the days after the fire. His clothes were destroyed, and so he found himself having to go out and do a little shopping. Not the thing that he wanted to do. But he had to go out and replace some of his clothes, so he went to a department store up in Fayetteville and picked out a few things and had a couple of sweaters. He went up to the counter and put the sweaters down there by the cash register, and there was a gentleman right behind the cash register, and he was ringing things up, and he just looked, and, and, and he said, well, sir, this is, this is kind of unusual today. And Ed asked him, well, what do you mean? He said, well, everybody else that's been in here today has been making exchanges and returns, bringing in Christmas presents that they couldn't wear or they didn't like and wanted to exchange something, but you're coming in actually buying something. That's, I'm kind of glad to see you. And, and Ed could have said, well, thank you, and then made his purchase and gone on, but he took a moment to be vulnerable. And Ed said, well, the reason I'm buying these sweaters is because just a few days ago I lost everything that I have in a fire. And all my clothes and most of my possessions that I hold dear. And so I'm having to make this purchase today. And when Ed said that, that fella came from around the counter and took a hold of Ed and said, Sir, when I was nine years old, my home burned to the ground. We lost everything. It was horrible. But we made it. And you will too. And with that, he gave him a hug. Now, Ed told that story and then said, you know, I had no idea that Jesus works at Hamrick's. Let us pray. Loving God, we never cease to be amazed at where we might find you. We hope to find you here at church, and we do. We hope to find you in our homes, and we do. We hope to find you in our devotions, and we do. But there are also times, Lord, that we run from you. We disobey, and even in those places we find you. Speaking a word of truth, correction, but also inviting us to come home, to repent, to turn, and to follow you. Lord, thank you that there is nowhere too far for you to go to reach us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 253. A little correction there in your worship bulletin. It's 253. Lead me to Calvary. <laughs> 